thank you guys for coming to this. This is our fifth webinar through the Peace in Kurdistan uh, Ecology Network. And we're really excited to have uh, Mohammed El Naim and Nick Hildyard speak to us today about the developing situation in the Sudan. Uh, Mohammed's going to talk uh, generally about the question of self determination for the Sudan and how that issue uh, arises in the uh, unfolding revolutionary developments over the past few years. And he will also mention generally how the ecological dimension is related to the struggle for self determination in the Sudan. And then Nick Hildyard from the Corner House. Uh, Mohammed, by the way, wears many hats, but the one that I'm most familiar with him is as a graduate student at the University of Cambridge, uh, writing what is sure to be a very important dissertation on the relationship between capitalism, patriarchy, and colonialism slash racism and the, the Black radical tradition, sort of bringing it up to date in dialogue with many of the big questions. Uh, but he also is a close follower of developments in the Sudan. He comes from the Sudan. So very interested to hear what he has to say and how he thinks about uh, the struggle for self-determination and particularly the ecological dimension. And then Nick Hildyard is going to talk to us about struggles over water, in particular the water supply question and how that relates to the evolution of the struggle in the Sudan and maybe a, a bit more generally in the African context. So very excited. I think it's a very important discussion and it's a discussion that kind of pushes us a little bit beyond a Kurdish-centric understanding of what the the prospects and challenges for democratic confederalism for self-determination in the 21st century are. So I don't want to take up too much time. So let me give the floor to Mohammed to speak first. And then Nick, and then we should have uh, plenty of time for a discussion. All right. The floor is yours, Mohammed. All right. Thanks. It's very nice to see everyone. And I'm glad that we have such a, like, uh, not an impersonal kind of thing. It makes me feel really comfortable um, and uh, just express these things. Of course, um, I've hit the Sudan revolution. I was a participant in the revolution in Sudan. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Jeff, full support. Um, back in 2018, I um, took my work with me and I joined the revolution um, in Sudan that led to the overthrow of a 30-year dictatorship of Omar al-Bashir. And I guess back in 2019, we had just assumed that maybe overthrowing the dictatorship was the first step, but we didn't realize the extent to which international forces and local forces would work together to try to undermine the revolution. And that's kind of the context or the background. One of the most important things to understand are some key dates. The revolution starts in December 2018. By April 2019, Amr al-Bashir, the dictator, is overthrown in a palace coup because of the pressure of a three-month sit-in in front of the military headquarters, the joining of some junior soldiers onto the side of the revolution, and a crisis among the upper brass of the military who try to get rid of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood-led uh, Umar al-Bashir government and pretend that they're overseeing a transition to democracy. Of course, going through the history that we've gone through, we've had revolutions in 1964 and in 1985, and we have very strong trade union traditions and very strong uh, democratic traditions. And we've seen this before. Um, so we decided to maintain the sit-in. And that sit-in we maintained successfully until June 3rd. So this man, uh, Amr Hamdan Dagalo, he is the uh, Muhammad Hamdan Dagalo. He's the leader of the Rapid Support Forces. Now, one thing to understand is with the coup that occurred, the palace coup that occurred in 2019, the military held into control, but also Mohammed Hamdan Dagolo did. So much so that the American charged affairs at the time, and I forget his name, forgive me for that, instead of congratulating the protesters for overthrowing the dictator of 30 years, Ramal al-Bashir, went straight to this man. Now, a really important thing to understand about this man is, is that he began his career as a camel herder and played a very big role in the Jinjaweed, who engaged in the Darfur genocide in 2003. And really, his name is Himeti, they call him. But Umar al-Bashir used to call him Himaiti, which means my protection, because he had a militia for sale for Umar al-Bashir, which not just uh, put down uprisings in the peripheries of Sudan, but also put down protests. And was he was basically protecting Umar al-Bashir until the last minute. And he, because of his instrumental role in the coup against Umar al-Bashir in response to the protests, he elevated himself to second in command. Now, 
Um, in June 2019, when the sit-in in the military headquarters continued, and the people in the sit-ins, not just in front of the military headquarters in Khartoum, but all across Sudan, were demanding a full transition to democracy with the help of the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, who were agitated by these uh, democratic protests. Hameti and his rapid support forces, the same forces that engaged in the genocide in Darfur and the peripheries of Sudan, put down and did a horrific massacre throwed protesters out into the Nile alive. There was mass reports of rape and, and violence. And the Sudanese people unabated engaged in a series of strikes and civil disobedience campaigns. And then a humongous march, which led to 4 million people taking to the streets, moving towards the Republican palace in the way that Sri Lankan protesters recently did. And that caused an emergency meeting among the United Arab Emirates, US, the UK, among many other forces. And a power sharing agreement was agreed to in the last minute, where the military and our rapid support forces would hold part of the power and civilian leaders would hold the other part. Of course, this was a betrayal towards the aspirations of the revolution, but it was a power sharing agreement that lasted from between 2019 until about 2022, when this man and the military chief, Burhan, engaged in a coup d'etat and threw all of the civilians who were part of the power sharing agreement into prison and have been in control of Sudan since. And so the, right now, uh, the resistance against him continues unabated. Every other day or every week, there are protests led by resistance committees, radical democratic unions in neighborhoods who organized protesters to try to overthrow the coup. Now, one thing to understand that's different about the power sharing agreement that we have today is, first of all, the international dimension. Hemeti, uh, this man, he is funded by the United Arab Emirates directly, and he has huge stakes in gold. This man was a rebel who used to fight against Hemeti, and actually Hemeti's forces amassed to put down re rebels like him, but who's now also entered into power with him, showing the deterioration of ethnic politics in Sudan more generally. I think there's a really important dimension to this that I want to get into. But the most important thing is throughout the history of Sudan, with all of the coup d'etats that we've had, we've never had the situation where, in addition to the military, which holds vast amounts of power over the economic resources of the country, small scale militias are also second in command. Or, and this is itself a story that I want to focus on today. I'm not going to get too deep into the complexities of the revolution. I just want to talk about the emergence of Hemeti and how we're going to start to see more Hemetis. And it's really difficult to explain the beginning of where a, a camel trader emerges to become the top of one of the most powerful militias in the country to the point where when Sudan's economy was really struggling, Hemeti as a power ploy invested $1 billion into the central bank. That's the amount of money that he's amassed. But before we talk about all of that, there's an ecological story here. And it's impossible to understand both him and the emergence of Minnawi and all of these other rebel groups who are now are in control with the military coup without understanding the ecological story. And before that, there's also something, because this is the Peace in Kurdistan uh, campaign, it's also something that we need to talk about in terms of Erjalan's philosophy. I mean, one of the things, I'm, as I'm sure most of you are all aware, is that part of the democratic confederalist project, which Erdogan proposes, is rooted in the concept of the democratic nation and the democratic republics. The democratic republic is supposed to ensure the self-determination potential of all different nations and provide those nations not only with a legal national constitution framework in which their rights will be respected, their rights to autonomy will be respected, but that also providing them with their right to self-defense. A confederation of radical democratic nations for Abdullah Öcalan is the best way in which to bring about a new democratic modernity, which will push back against capitalist modernity. But one thing that is very, very, very important and that often gets overlooked is the ecological dimension to the democratic nation concept. These are quotes that come from his pamphlet towards a democratic nation. And he says, just as society cannot sustain itself without self-defense, the nourishment and sustenance of society is only possible with economic autonomy, dependent on soil conservation and reforestation, ecology, and commune. 
And these are very strong words on the ecological and they've strengthened the importance of the ecological side because he also says that op opposition to deforestation and soil erosion, which are the biggest enemies of society and life, chimes with the spirit of total mobilization. It declares the protection of land and reforestation to be the most valuable forms of labor. Now, one thing, when we return back to this picture here, one thing to understand about the emergence of these two people, and one thing to understand about the importance of the ecological dimension to the concept of democratic nation is, both of them claim, both um, Abdu, uh, Hamdan Dagalo emerged as a representative of his tribe, the Rizaygat, and uh, Dagalo, a representative of his tribe, the Zagawa, they both claimed that they were fighting for their people and they're both armed militias. And yet, in the absence of a, a total approach, which also looks into ecology, we see that if you give a person who claims to represent their own people a militia and another people who, who claims to represent their own people a militia, that doesn't necessarily mean that a democratic nation project will emerge. Sometimes ethno federalism can go in the wrong direction. We see this, for example, in Ethiopia right now with the Oromo and the TPLF and all of these different groups organizing themselves as se separate nations, but not democratic nations, and being very complicit in the kind of warfare and international warfare and all of the people who profit from warfare, right? And, and having leaders who are ethnic entrepreneurs almost, um, and, and, and it's the common people who die in these situations. And the ecological dimension, if people want to treat it as secondary, which Ajalan does not, this, I hope, is a prophecy story for others to know what could happen if you don't focus on the ecological dimension. And this is where the story begins of Himmeti. Now, this is the structure of Darfur. Himmeti, I told you, was a camel trader. He emerged from this group. This part is called the Western, in Western Sudan. He emerged from this group, the camel nomads, okay? This man, this, this person, emerged from, the, emerged from the same area, the camel nomad group, but these are ecological zones. And these ecological zones correspond directly to ethnic zones. Now, Himeti comes from this zone here, the camel trader zone, and he, he comes from the Rezegat, which are an Arab tribe. Now, the issue has always been that the structure of this society, even though he comes from this Rezegat, who are a, a lot of time cattle traders, he comes from a minority of this tribe, which comes from this area, and they, they, they trade camel. Now, throughout the history of Sudan, Darfur has had conflicts, and these conflicts have often been related to ecological issues. This is just an example. So uh, we brought up the, the Darfur genocide in 2003, which really provided the, the rapid support forces and Hemeti and all of these people with the weapons and, 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 and everything that they used to engage in a genocide and which allowed them to rise up to the situation they're in today. But really, this goes back to the times of independence, first because the whole area, Darfur, because of the nation state and uneven development, has always been undeveloped at the expense of the central areas like Khartoum, etc. And that has also meant that because of the absence of any kind of democratic or even capitalist modernity for that part in the Western Sudan, that the people of Western Sudan have always felt almost like second class citizens to the broader nation state project. And this is a story that we see constantly in the post-colonial nation state since the 1950s. But in addition to that, struggles over natural resources have often turned first have often turned into tribal conflicts and then ethnic conflicts. And these are examples of all of those kinds of struggles. The Medob, this, that, that, from 57, 68, 74, 76, 1980, 1982, 84, et cetera. One of the most fascinating things was during this time in Dar the Darfur region, there was uh, a lot of communist political prisoners who were seen as agitating against the government. And one of these communist political prisoners who became an academic later on in his life, his name is Mohammed Suleiman, was imprisoned in between the years 1971 and 1978. And he noticed that at the height of which there was droughts or that there was uh, problems of, of lack of rainfall, there was increased amount of people who were coming to prison, usually of, over these tribal conflicts. And a huge, a huge number of those people came exactly from where? From Himeti's tribe. Camel herders who have been excluded from the state, et cetera. 
Um, and in general, this has been an aspect of Sudanese politics, not only because of natural resources and, and ecological destruction and desertification, but also more broadly because of the nation, the colonial state and the ways in which certain groups were privileged in Sudan, mainly those people of my group in the center, at the expense of the people from the peripheries of Sudan. And uh, that meant that in the eve of independence, all most of the political power came to, you guessed it, my group at the expense of both of these groups, the Arab, so-called Arabs, and the so-called Africans, even though they're all Africans, and these ethnic identities actually emerge due to struggles over resources. Now, one thing about these struggles, as you can see here, is that the conflict increases, and there's huge spikes of conflict precisely in those moments when there's shortages of rainfall. Now, we know for a fact that a compounding factor to structural um, drought is climate change, global climate change. Um, and this is the way in which global capitalist modernity indirectly lays the ground for conflict among groups. But then on top of this, in 1987, the conflicts reached a new qualitative stage because for the first time also international forces started to take advantage and play with these conflicts. Right. And this is this this is a quote directly from someone who who had been trying to uh, negotiate the conflict that was emerging between, in fact, these two groups who are now shaking hands. Um, and Hemeti, he emerges from one of these groups. There is a gap. And he said the conflict we're trying to resolve today began as an ordinary conflict between nomadic pastoralists and sedentary farmers over natural resources. Now, I want us to just go back here because this is the ethnic makeup and it corresponds directly to ecological zones. Historically, this place has been the most fertile, the center of Darfur. And these places have been arid, right? Um, and this is where the camel nomads are and the cattle nomads are, who depend on, on the Nile, depend on, on certain kinds of things. Now, during moments of drought, what these two groups end up doing is they end up coming into, they end up breaking away from their migratory zones that they've established over thousands of years and which cultural symbiosis has allowed for relative stability. And because of the increased amount of desertification and lack of, of fertile land, um, even in their dry areas, they end up coming in here to the settled farms. And that ends up creating conflicts over natural resources. And it's happened structurally for the past 50 years, but increased intensity since the 1970s. But it never really took on an ethnic form until really the 80s. Um, and, 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 and there was the descriptions here was the reckless use of firearms to ruthlessly massacre our peaceful citizens and the macabre mutilations are completely out of character with the people of Darfur. This is in around 1987. Never before were whole village communities annihilated and women, children and the elderly so mercilessly mowed down by machine guns. All of a sudden, these conflicts over resources, as this person says, which began between nomadic pastoralists and sedentary farmers over natural resources, they ended up becoming huge ethnic conflicts interpreted as ethnic conflicts, interpreted among the people as a conflict between Arabs and a conflict between Africans, okay? Even though all Sudanese people are to a degree Afro-Arabs. And, um, and this led one person to the, the mediator to believe, to believe that there are external forces at play. And in reality, there were. OK, on one side, the so-called Arabs were being supported by Libya's Gaddafi and um, were being supported um, by Iraqi's Arab Ba'athist government um, because of the war, the Libyan war in Chad. Um, they were hoping to use these people as proxy forces. On the other side, the, the so-called Africans were getting support from the SPLM um, who were fighting a war in the south, again, also related to the marginalization and second-class citizenship of Southern people in the face of the post-colonial state. Um, and 27 tribes came together and called themselves the Arab Awakening. And they destroyed African, um, African village, so-called African villages, or those they deemed Africans. And the so-called Africans armed themselves as well. And they started fighting back. And each group was claiming that the, the struggle was over racism and ethnic conflict. But really, underneath those struggles was the problem of the absence or the deterioration of traditional ecological forms of conflict resolution, which were being made impossible not only by international forces, 
um, people who profit from war, but also in addition to that, they're being made impossible by global climate change. And one thing that's also really, really important to understand about the situation is, is that this person's tribe were now also being recruited into fighting the war in the South. They were being recruited by the Sudanese government, which wanted to take over oil fields to um, massacre entire villages to make space for big Western companies, specifically in Britain, British oil companies, to take over that land. And through that, they amassed enough power over a 20 or 30 year period to the point where in 2003, they unleashed a genocide working for the Sudanese government. And then by 2019, they overthrew the very Sudanese government, which tried to use them for so long and thought that they were their pawns. And this was a situation of the, the chess pieces becoming dominant power. So this is in general, the broader ecological dimension which led to one of the biggest obstacles to self-determination and the creation of a democratic nation project in Sudan. Yeah, and this is why the ecological dimension is so important. One can't forget it. Now, this was the story just a few days ago, um, literally two days ago on, um, on, on CNN. And it literally shows that Russia now has control over uh, oil fields in Sudan. But don't get this wrong. It's not just Russia. The United Arab Emirates does as well. Um, who, of course, are part of the American sphere of influence. But everybody's getting their, their, their fair share of gold in Sudan, specifically in the area which uh, Nick will be talking about, um, which is the Meroe area, the Meroe Dam. Um, and this, this report demonstrated um, some, a few different things, uh, among which was that the rapid support forces, uh, this person, um, have a huge monopoly over gold and are working with uh, the Wagner forces. Uh, the Russian uh, paramilitary group to uh, extract oil in Sudan. Um, and, uh, and then in addition to that, at the same time in which he's playing on the Russian side, um, for example, here there's a story um, by the CNN that says on the same day that Russia launched its invasion of, Ura of Ukraine, Hemeti was heading a Sudanese delegation in Moscow to advance relations. He's also playing on the United Arab Emirates, which is also part of the American spirit influence side. Um, and he's created vast amounts of control over gold reserves, which he sells uh, in the billions, um, and he, in, in basically conflict diamonds, conflict, I mean, conflict gold, uh, artisanal miners who are exploited uh, under the most severe ecological conditions to send that, that, that gold to the markets in Dubai, et cetera. Um, that gold is also being used for Russia to evade sanctions from the United States. Um, and as a gold, as a reserve um, against that. And, um, and, 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 it, and so it says, you know, the, U, and the United Arab Emirates, even though Russia, and of course CNN has its own Cold War reasons to be able to emphasize the Russian dimension to this, the United Arab Emirates, a key ally of, 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 the, of, of the United States, has also says 99.2% of Sudan's gold exports go to the United Arab Emirates. And that's subcontracted through RSF militiamen, um, who again, these people who claim to represent an ethnic cause um, being subcontracted by international capital to mine gold and to send their own soldiers to fight in Yemen as well. Um, and so this is the relationship between Sudan's gold, wealthy foreign bar backers, and the biggest obstacles that we have right now, again, also related to the ecological extraction of resources, to our self-determination and our revolution. We're being, the, our, our enemies are being propped up, not just by Russia, they're also being propped up by the United States, by the United Arab Emirates, et cetera. And so it's, it's a, it, Hemeti's RSF grew out of the infamous Janjaweed militia active in Darfur, men with no mercy, uh, found that they it, it engaged in civilians in, in torture, extrajudicial killings and mass rapes, forced displacement of entire communities, all of this is necessary now for the forces of global capital to be able to, you know, outsource the control of um, of these chaotic environments for the smooth extraction of resources that end up in in, in markets in the United Arab Emirates, the West, um, in the reserves of Russia, and whoever whoever is engaged in this, um, and so these are the ways in which. Uh, 
we're going to start to see more of this. I mean, let's be clear here. Yeah, climate change is not uh, the cause, but it is a multiplying effect. It has a multiplier effect. If you don't find ways of reconciling with the ecosphere, you'll see the emergence of more himmetis in more countries. And believe me, it's not just going to be Sudan and the peripheries of the world. This is, we're going to start to see these kinds of militias and the, the kinds of even fascist militias emerge in, in here in the global north as well. Well, where if, just imagine if I was in the global north, in the global north as well. And so that then returns back to, again, within the conversation of at least Abdullah Ejelan's ideology, you know, you can have armed self-defense and ethnic communities, and this is very important also for the Rojava revolution and the Kurdish revolution in general, but the importance of Abdullah Ejelan's entire ideology in here is very important. The ecological dimension is not peripheral. It's not something that you just skirt around over by planting a few trees or something. You have to understand that if you want different ethnic communities to live in peace with one another, then you also have to figure out ways of sharing resources and removing the element of profit and the people who profit from our ethnic divisions for the smooth facilitation of exploitation of our natural resources for their own goal. And these kinds of problems may not be apparent now, but in 20, 30, 40 years, they will be. So the ecological aspect of the democratic confederalist project has to be at the center, right? Because ethnic boundaries and different democratic nations, right? Sometimes we can reify these things, yeah? And it becomes communities who are pitted against each other or communities who even may understand themselves as nations, but not realize that they're only understanding themselves through ethnic divisions because of these deeper underlying ecological problems and climate change. And that actually the goal is, is for us to celebrate the diversity of different human cultures, but not to become a, I'm Oromo versus I'm Tigray, I'm Jahli versus I'm uh, you know, Denka, I'm uh, Kurd versus I'm uh, Assyrian. We don't wanna create those kinds of ethnic divisions um, in contexts of, of, of conflict, uh, of resource scarcity. So we need to incorporate in our political projects, strong, radical democratic usage of ecological resources. And that's basically what I want to also talk about today. Not only the obstacles to self-determination within Sudan right now, because of all of the global ecological problems and local ecological problems and the people who profit from those ecological problems. But also I want Sudan here to be a kind of prophecy for other countries who may face these kinds of problems soon. You know, the ecological project has to be at the center of the democratic confederalist project. And that is, again, we'll return to Ejelan's quotes, just as society cannot sustain itself without self-defense, the nourishment and sustenance of society is only possible with economic autonomy, dependent on soil conservation, reforestation, ecology, and commune. Opposition to deforestation and erosion, which the case of Darfur Sudan shows very well, is the biggest enemy of society and life. And it chimes with the spirit of total mobilization, right? The protection of land and reforestation has to be the most valuable forms of labor. So that is um, one dimension that I, of the Sudanese revolution that I wanted to highlight today. And I'm looking forward to hearing now from, uh, from Nick. Thank you. That was really brilliant. Do you want me to go now, or is or what about questions? For, for yeah, I, I was wondering that, and what do people think? Because um, um, there is a question that I have that is that uh, is not related to the uh, ecological dimension, but it but you bring it up, and it's a very interesting issue. Uh, my Rastafarian friends in Kenya are adamant about one thing when they talk about the, the uh, Ojalan's ideas. One idea that they are very skeptical of is the idea that every ethnic group should be uh, mobilizing autonomously. And they argue that, that, that uh, they're all down for uh, radical direct democracy, ecological uh, 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 ecology at the center. Uh, uh, but they think that, the, the, that uh, it's important that you have a united 
front of mobilization that brings together people from different ethnicities, precisely because uh, uh, they think that one of the problems in Kenya, and we can say more generally in, in, African, in the African context has been all of this reification of ethnic boundaries. Uh, and so they worry that uh, the democratic nation idea uh, will contribute to further reification of ethnic boundaries. So what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I think that one thing to understand is, is that there's no universal formula. And, uh, you know, I, I also feel that Ojalan has in, in his writings, he's always focusing on the Middle East specifically, because the context in Africa is going to be different from the context in the Middle East. Um, but that doesn't mean that the, the very spirit of the democratic nation process isn't applicable in different countries. In a country like Turkey, which said that Kurds, for example, are confused mountain Turks. Yeah, the erasure of your ethnic identity and your tribe and your nation, yeah, is part of the nation state project. It's a project of homogenizing various different peoples and different cultures, trying to erase traces of history and erase cultures and traditions in the name of one hegemonic identity on the basis of complete lies, like the sun theory of, of language and, and that the Kurds don't exist and the criminalization of their language, et cetera. Of course, in the context of Turkey, where Armenians and Assyrians and, and, and all of these different uh, minority groups have been totally, totally told to prevent, to, to, to deny their own existence, the democratic nation project, which, which, which Ajalan proposes is the right and correct one. Then on the other hand though, when you're looking at countries like, um, like uh, Ethiopia, for example, which also went through that process, we saw the emergence of different groups who started to fight against the homogenizing uh, thing of the Ethiopian empire. But then what we also saw is in the absence of a strong ideology, um, which uh, doesn't reify these different nations, the emergence of ethnic entrepreneurs, you know, people who, who, who are the top base of these ethnic subgroups who, who, who use their ethnicity in ways of benefiting themselves against not only their groups, but against others and are willing to see people fight against each other. In that kind of context, of course, the Democratic Nation Project is gonna to have to be reimagined and rearticulated, you know? But in general, that's why you have to see the whole project, yeah? And you can't just isolate different parts of it, yeah? In, in, it is still perfectly fine, I think, for Oromo people to be happy about who they are in Ethiopia and the Tigray people to be happy about who they are in Ethiopia and everything like this without having, but, but in the absence of a democratic republic, in the absence where, in the situation where you can profit by, see, by seizing upon the struggles of your own people, which are legitimate struggles, at the end of the day, the, both the camel herders in the case of Sudan and the, 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 the pastoral sedentarists of also, they all have their own claims of being uh, marginalized, and those are real claims. But it's just that the upper brass of these groups take advantage of that. I don't think that there is one size fits all solution, but I do think that the democratic nation idea or project at least moves us in the right direction. It forces us to deal with 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 the reality of ethnic divisions and and forces us to figure out creative creative solutions for it. And, and, and most importantly, tells us one of the most important things that the nation state, even in the situation, the example I gave is always that body which doesn't provide a solution to these ethnic communities. It, it creates more divisions between them and it, it, it lays the foundation, especially because of its insistence of extraction, extraction, extraction. And, and it's, it's let's do anything possible for our extraction. Let's do anything possible to put out our fires. Let's do anything possible to fight the Kurds or the South Sudanese. You know, that kind of mentality of the nation state is the thing that alienates communities from each other, alienates the leaders of these communities from their people and alienates communities from themselves. So I, I think that's, that's, that's my view on, on that whole thing. Yeah, very good. Uh, so two more questions. We got Les and Marco both want to say something. Uh, Les, I think you had your hand up first. Yes, thanks. Uh, I mean, it, it's clear that you know an, an ecological approach by the relevant groups, or perhaps a, a better ecological approach, is necessary in order to minimize the resource conflicts and at least to, to the extent of avoiding overt physical conflict. I mean, that would be true anywhere. 
But as we see in Sudan and so many other places, I mean, there's a long history going back to the imperial rule, uh, which was then continued by the, the post-colonial regimes to exploit ethnic conflicts, but to represent all conflicts as ethnic ones, it, you know, divide and rule to, you know, in order to maintain or restore that, that state power. So it, it seems to me that there needs to be a specific strategy to undermine that ethnicization of the conflict by the state power you know, alongside a, a more effective ecological approach. I mean, so what would such a strategy be or what has it been? What have been the efforts in the Sudan? Good. Uh, can we take another question, a few more questions, and I'll try to answer them all? So that I can sure. Nick sure. Questions. That sounds good. Marco, you, you were next, and then Nick also has a question. Yeah, uh, sure. Apologies in advance for maybe oversimplifying and posing hypotheticals. Uh, but given you know the, the resource-rich nature of, of South Sudan, and the amount of money that is being uh, plundered uh, from from those regions, um, and again, hypothetical, you know, countries like Bolivia or Venezuela uh, that have nationalized their resource extraction, um, is, is there a possibility of something like that in South Sudan that would then be used to mitigate the uh, the, the the resource conflicts that are currently taking place and and possibly benefit? the larger society uh, in the country? Those are two big questions. I don't, do you want to take those two or you want to keep getting more? Cause Salah also has a question now, as does Nick still. Do you want to, do you want to listen to all four questions first or you want to try those two? All four? Okay. Nick, go ahead. Yeah, no, I thought it's um, very good questions and a really brilliant, um, introduction thank you so much Mohammed. I, I was um <clears throat> i was very pleased that you um you uh, mentioned Mohammed suleiman who's an old comrade um he's actually on corner house's board um and i've i've discussed some of these issues about ethnicity and and uh, ecological conflict and other conflicts with him several times and uh, there's a couple of things that um I think are worth mentioning in, in the Darfur context. One is that, I mean, traditionally, <clears throat> and I'm, you know, historically perhaps, um, the pastoral groups and the, and the sedentary groups have had a relationship where at times of drought, you know, it's been quite normal for the um, uh, pastoralists to move on to, <clears throat> onto um, the, the farmer's land and there's a relationship, the marriage, intermarriage, other, other trading relationships and so on, which um, ensure that this is quite a, a smooth process. But the, um, <clears throat> the climate change is, I mean, where it's really changed things is that it's lengthened the duration of which people are coming onto people's land. The droughts are longer and therefore the tensions, the potential tensions become um, more difficult to manage through traditional means. Added to which, um, as I understand it, the uh, nomadic groups <clears throat> are locked into um, uh, big trading patterns with the, um, with the Middle East, um, uh, the UEA and so on, exporting beef to, to um, UEA exporting camels and so on to UEA. So a massively increased herd numbers in order that are sort of going on beyond climate. Um, and I think one of the points that Mohammed makes is that, you know, yeah, there have always been some ethnic tensions between, between groups. People have been very proud of their ethnicity. There have always been a load of, of uh, crossovers between ethnic groups. Um, you know, the tribe isn't completely unitary. You've got a load of, uh, much as the British would have liked, have tried to make it so, loads of different cross relationships. But under certain circumstances, and I think this is a really interesting question, conflicts over resources, in this case over land, um, become conflicts over 
ethnicity or translated into conflicts over ethnicity and ethnicity becomes as material a resource as uh, land itself. And it's that, that creation of ethnicity or transformation of ethnicity in something very material that um, enables uh, political, politically motivated capitalization of that conflict, I think. So some of those points I, 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 um, I would be interesting to explore a bit. So it's more of a point than a question. Yeah, no, very no, that's interesting. Excellent, excellent, excellent point. Uh, and and I think that the, it ties in directly to the, the first question that was asked and, and, and somewhat indirectly to the second question. So let's start with, the, with those two questions on the naturalization of ethnicity, the, materia, the material reification of ethnicity in the face of these conflict struggles. I think, look, I, I'm going to talk about my own political philosophy. Um, and 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 then and then and we can maybe just think about them. And so one of the things that, and I hate to bring also philosophy into these very deep, deep conversations, but I think it's important. You know, I mean, um, one of the things that's kind of central to to a Marxist understanding of society is is that we're also working towards a negation of the negation in the sense that, in the sense that. The working class, if, if they're struggling for a, a classless, they're struggling for a classless society, which means the abolition of themselves, okay, and and the abolition of the working class as a category of itself in itself. Now, for me, the ultimate aspiration of any racial justice projects that I'm engaging in, right, or ethnic and and, and separation between ethnicity and race here is important because we might see this as something in the peripheries of Sudan, but it's just as much true for racial struggles here. Is I am fighting for racial justice in order to abolish abolish race in the same way that I fight on the side of the working class to abolish class. And that has to be at the end of our emancipatory horizon when we're having these conversations. Now, the creation, in order for me to get there though, in the same way that in order for me to, as a worker, to get to the point where I want to create a classless society, I have to be aware of myself as a worker under the real material realities that I'm, I'm in. And in the same way, I have to be aware within the context of the West, where I do a lot of my racial justice, of the racialization of my black skin. I am black. But I don't want to get into the difficult the difficult situation, right? And this is a, as a political, as a political principle, of then starting to go too far in the naturalization of my pigment, of my blackness, to the point where. If I search, for example, in the history for black, an ancient black civilization to be the justification for my pride in my black self, that should only be in a way of raising my awareness of my blackness in order to fight in a world where there is no such thing as blackness and whiteness and, 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 cl and class and everything like that. But you become in uh, the problem with reification when these things become material is, is that you can often also fall into the trap of naturalizing these things which are the creation of ecological conflicts or the history of white supremacy for the sake of racial capitalism etc and for me this is what when it comes to the incorporation of and and i don't want to impose my own personal philosophy but the helpfulness of the democratic nation concept is that it allows groups like the kurds or other groups the assyrians etc who have been denied their existence to develop that sense of consciousness in order to fight but for me, the end of the horizon is a world where there is no such thing as Black people, there is no such thing as Kurds, there's no such thing as Zagawa, there's no such thing as, as, as these different ethnicities. And in order to do that, we have to build the political project that will get us there. And part of that is ecological sharing. Part of that is the democratic nation. Part of that is allowing every group which has been marginalized, whether it's on the basis of their class relationship or it's on the basis of their ethnicity, to be able to take pride in that until we reach a point where there is one humanity okay, where all of these different histories, all of these different cultures are seen as the legacy of us all. Okay. <laughs> And I think that that sounds overly political or something, but it becomes a, a, it becomes from from out of that vision is where we should build our political projects and our political program. And that's what, that's what I'm going to suggest is the ecolo if if these identities become more reified and more firm and more real because of ecological struggles over land in this case, remove the conditions that do that, and we will be moving a step closer. In the Apologies, United States. Um, may I just apologies for disrupting you. There's someone who's using the tap, slamming the doors. 
If it's possible, can everyone just mute their microphone so that I can fully listen to what Mohammed is saying? Okay. I think it's Joe. Okay. Um, but in and I think in general, right, that's the direction that I want my politics or the, any political project I'm engaging in to move towards. And that's why I'm an anti-capitalist. That's why I'm an anti-racist. That's why I'm an anti-colonial thinker. That's the point of the democratic nation project. That is the point so that all of the, the civilization of democratic modernity becomes ours as human beings, that I can claim Salah al-Din Ayyub, or maybe not Salah al-Din Ayyub, but the radical traditions of the Kurds, just as much as someone else can claim the struggles of, of my African people. And that's the world we're moving towards. Remove the conditions that separate us, but also let us acknowledge who we are as individuals. And that's why I think that as a preliminary stage to the society that we want to reach, awareness of self and group is important, but we should also remove, we should we also be working for a politics that removes the fundamental basis in which we understand ourselves as Zagawa or as, as Black or as everything, fighting police brutality, et cetera, fighting against the oppression of Kurds, but also understanding and recognizing that the nation state as a political project is an obstacle to that. And it has been the common sense for self-determination movements until now to assume that the self, the nation state is the vehicle towards that. And that again comes back to the question of nationalization. For me, on the question of nationalization is, is to the degree that it's possible, we should be fighting for the nationalization of our resources. But the issue and the reality of the matter is also is that we're part of a global capitalist system, which if not punishes, then creates the conditions, especially in our neoliberal world, of making nationalization not a viable option as it once was. And precisely because of that, for example, Venezuela is, is as, a, as a, a once emancipatory political project, is falling apart. You know, the, 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 the truth of the matter is, is that even in the case of Darfur, in the situation when Nimeri took over in his coup, he abolished all political parties, began massive nationalization campaigns, and tried to resolve the, 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 the ethnic problems in Sudan by wishing them away. And it didn't work. Um, it, 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 it caused those ethnic problems to go underground. It caused people to pretend that they didn't exist for a while. And when the situation came up, they did it again. And so I, I don't believe, I, I, as, well, as much as I, for example, believe right now and will fight to the death for the nationalization of Britain's railways, I don't believe that that is a broader or, or uh, um, a, a long-term solution to the problems of ethnic cleavages and racialization in general and the capitalism. Um, but yeah, I, I know I didn't really hit it because I don't have the answers. I'm not gonna lie, and put them, but I do have a, a worldview on what I think political projects is. So there's there's three more questions right now, uh, but uh, with respect to Les's question, I mean, I, I also wanted to just uh, intervene a little bit with respect to get, push back a little bit. I think it's important to distinguish between race and ethnicity, because I find it attractive, the idea of a world in which uh, the lie of race is abolished. Uh, but I don't find it attractive, uh, uh, emancipatory, the idea of, uh, of a world in which ethnicity is abolished. I think that the plurality of ethnicities is, is part of the rich human heritage. And so I think we have to, so when it comes to Les's question of like strategies for, uh, 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 let's say, uh, rendering less explosive ethnic divisions, I don't think that the abolition of ethnicity is what we should be arguing for. And I think democratic nation in particular is a, it, it takes on a position where, uh, you know, the multiplicity of ethnicities without reifying any one of them, because you can be hybrid, mixed and what have you. But this diversity of ethnicities is a good thing. And part of a, of, of a free world would be one in which ethnicity uh, uh, can, remains. So uh, I want to push you to, to answer uh, Les's question about how to render these ethnic divisions less explosive if there's a particular strategy at the same time of thinking about uh, maybe the significance of distinguishing between race and ethnicity. Uh, and then maybe, uh, 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 maybe you want to answer that before we ask the other three questions or, or, or maybe if, 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 if you'd also give me, yeah. if, if we'd let, just let Nick have his talk first, and then maybe we could have a broader discussion and everyone just kind of on make, that. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's listen to the other three questions. Uh, and then uh, uh, and see if you have a, a response to that, and then we'll, and then we'll open it up for Nick to respond. So Salah had had something he wanted to say. Stephen had something he wanted to say, and then Jihad had his hand up for a minute, but then he put it down. So I don't know if he still wants to say something. Yeah. It's okay. Fine. Is it my turn? Uh, Sally, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, thanks very much for a very challenging presentation um, and very exciting vision for Sudan. And it's one of the, some of the things I was talk, thinking about is also in case of Sudan is Islamic identity. And if you look at the history of Sudan, it's very deeply rooted from the uh, from the 19th century, you know, with the Mahdi's, uh, Mahdi rebellion against the British and the British takeover. And it's resonates in Sudan even today. So in the kind of Islamic movements in Sudan, uh, discussion about imposition of Sharia, for example, and 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 that also alienated the Christian minority in Sudan. So we can see the results what happened in 2000. There were two civil wars, and then we had then the separation of South Sudan. In fact, it, it did damage to both the North Sudan and South Sudan economically as well. But that happened. That's the reality. So this play of religious Islamic um, focus on Hamethi, but I think it goes for me. It goes beyond Hamethi, really. Because I think that what we have in Sudan is a post-colonial state, neo-colonial state, where the army is, is a power elite, highly centralized, highly disciplined, uh, not only controlling the state and the monopoly of violence, but controlling the economy. I mean, I understand 80% of the economy, which large sectors have been controlled by the army. And I think the state is central to what's going on. And I think when these ethnic conflicts happen, you know, the, this, this, uh, this army had, was trained by the British <laughs> and, and they know the British played divide and rule one whatever ethno religious or religious dimension being used as well. So I, I, I think the challenge is the state. And I think the current struggle in Sudan is amazing. You know, I mean, the, 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 you know, the resistance committees, 5,000 of them across the country, an immense pressure. They are being surveilled. They are being locked up. Leaders are being picked up. So I think that's the central. I'm not. I'm not disregarding other struggles going on. You know, we had violence even in the Nile State recently, which was pretty bad away from Darfur. And one of the way that Darfur has come to Khartoum as well is through Hamati. But Hamati is one aspect of it. I think the military leadership is highly centralized. It's bigger than Hamati. They are meeting secretly. They are negotiating secretly with 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 Egypt, with uh, Saudi Arabia, with UAE, with Americans as well. We don't know what goes on, but they're doing it all the time. I think that's a central challenge in Sudan. Really, is how we overthrow the military power as well. It is quite uniquely centralized. You know, Very, about that. tough question. Very tough question. Stephen and now Sonia, and I don't, I still don't know if Jihad wanted to ask something. Okay. Stephen and Sonia then, and then we'll, and then we'll uh, open it up to Nick. Okay, thanks, Jeff. And yeah, thanks, Mohammed. That's been absolutely fascinating. Um, mine's just really more of a, an informational question, just to get a little bit more maybe detail about the, uh, the sort of, we started to, to mention agriculture. I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more if you're able to tell us more about the sort of wider ecological situation there. I was sort of interested in the uh, proportion of the agriculture that's um, um, monocultural cash crops, how that's been exported and who benefits from that and are there other forms of uh, polyculture still uh, in place in the Sudan? Just to get a bit more context around the some of the other um, kind of interfaces between the, the economy and the ecology. Yeah. And Sonia, your question? Um, thank you. So um, I also actually wanted to ask about the arid land that you were discussing, um, how long it's been arid and what it was like prior to it being arid, if, it, if there was a stage where it wasn't arid. Um, and in that case, what do you think um, would be the ideal way to go about um, trying to prevent further uh, desertification of the land? Um, and also I wanted to make a point about 
um, the removal of ethnicity in societies. I agree with Jeff that um, if one were to remove plurality in a society, then one truly risks um, not only um, diminishing a lot of the culture and a lot of the uh, importance of what that ethnicity brings to space, but one also risks creating adversity and uh, interaction amongst the people um, if you uh, choose to alienate people because they want to um, express their ethnicity. Um, and I think that if you do go down that route where you remove ethnicity, then there's really no difference between a nation state and us. Um, the richness of ethnicity is what makes us different. It's what makes us um, a better, a third and better way towards democracy. Um, I also think that something really important you said was, um, I don't have all of the answers. And we need to remove that pressure on people to have all of the answers. Um, a lot of the times what I hear in a political space is people saying that um, we, we don't know a better method of governance than capitalism. Um, and they're trying to seek out a perfect solution. There is no perfect solution. And we need to encourage that to become part of our discourse where we say we don't have all of the answers, but we're trying to find a third way. That way we don't raise people's expectations to imagine that we have all of the answers. We are honest with them and we're telling them this capitalism isn't working, that nation state idea isn't working, this fascist idea isn't working. However, there is a third way. There may be many faults, but we're working on trying to find solutions and a better way of existing or coexisting amongst each other. Um, and I think talking like that amongst the civilian population is really helpful in getting them to understand there may be disputes between the ethnicities. But there is a way of trying to make it work together. But crucially, I really do want to know about this arid land, please. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, go, go ahead, give a, give a round of responses, then we'll turn to Nick. Okay, I thank you all for these really thoughtful responses. I really appreciate it. And I just want to say that um, we all don't necessarily disagree on, 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 um, on the importance, I think, of, of, of the beauty of, of diversity of human experience and the beauty of the diversity of our, of our people and, 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 and all of the histories that we, we, love, we love about ourselves and things like that. Um, I, think, I think also maybe a, a, good, a good thing to, 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 to realize is, is, is the African context in which I, I speak from might be very different than, than a lot of other contexts. Um, because, I mean, within our countries, um, we have situations where you have borders. Of course, this is very similar to the Kurd Kurdish situation, but you have borders um, that cut through uh, arbitrarily because, the, because of the way in which 19th century high imperialism worked, where tribes are divided on both sides and are forced to have different loyalties. Uh, to their separate nation states, the same tribe could be divided by one border and, and have those different loyalties to their separate nation states. And then in a, and if those nation states um, go into war against each other, which has often happened, um, the tribe that's divided between this arbitrary border is now forced to divide their loyalties onto the either side and eventually even fragments further to the point where the one old tribe they imagine themselves to be has now become different with different uh, origin stories and different. Um, and, and so for me, it's just remove, I guess, one way to reframe what I'm trying to say about ethnicity is remove. Sorry. Uh, Oh yeah, just remove those situations or those conditions which create the idea that our differences are enough for us to, uh, the, the need for us to mobilize uh, mobilize politics for and, 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 and why person in my tribe can't marry someone in their tribe, et cetera, et cetera. Remove that and allow a situation where all of the different peoples of the world are proud of their histories particularly, but that the ethnicity doesn't really mean um, this this thing that alienates them from other human beings it's it's this beautiful different story of the broader bigger human story um i, I guess that's that's what i want to do and and i know way am i any an, an advocate of for example um uh imposing homogeneity like ataturk or anything like that that's for sure um but on the on the ecological question 
monocultures, etc. I mean, I guess the one way to think about the monocultures question is to think about it in in, in comparison with or in, in communion with the broader question of industrialized agriculture in general. I mean, a lot of what a lot of agro agroecologists talk about these days, especially, is that the kinds of um, multiple different types of crops and the avoidance of monoculture um, it has been a central feature of most agriculture in human history until quite relatively recently. And at least in our case in Sudan, the very same process which came brought divide and rule and the very same process which made people, um, uh, you know, I, that, brought, that imposed the, the modern nation state was the same process that imposed uh, monocultures. And I think part of the exacerbation of the ethnic conflicts which we talked about because there's so many different dimensions to it is the role of big agricultural companies who need land and who are willing to work with whoever whichever militia can provide them with that land or as as was also brought up the army which can clear up that land and sell vast resources part of the huge reason why the united arab emirates and saudi arabia uh, find uh, their their interests intertwined with the military, which, as we've already learned today um, from Saleh, have huge control, vast control over dozens of parastatal companies, including in the agricultural sector, is because they also have vast amounts of farmland. And the increased arid environment in Saudi Arabia is forcing them to find farmland elsewhere. And if they don't have a stable environment for that farmland, as in a military dictatorship, then they, uh, which again, that farmland is, is main focus is, for example, to take 33,000 or 4,000 uh, acres, 5,000 acres, and just do one crop, bersim. And that bersim crop or the alpha alpha crop is used to feed the cows. And those cows are then used to provide milk to all of the countries in the Middle East. And that 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 that's also why there's heavy intervention and why the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia hedge their bets with Himeti, who I talked about. I mean, they're all inter they're, all of these things are so interrelated. But of course, farming practices and the the imposition of of a monoculture is is a huge aspect of it as a structural foundation of the global food system is a huge part of the problems that we face. But there's just so many different ways in which we can talk about this. And as for the land, has the land been arid? It has been arid, but not this arid. I mean, one of the things is, is within the past 50 or 60 years, um, the amount of desertification that's happened has been happening at an extremely rapid rate. Um, where, and like, like what Nick said, is the traditional means of conflict resolution, which included things like intermarriage, which included kind of that vision of ethnicity that you're talking about, where the, the different ethnic groups, they're proud of their own histories, but they don't necessarily hate each other. That has broken down um, because of the increased amount of the desertification, because of the long periods in which drought happens. Drought is now longer, and that increases the chance for more ethnic conflict. Um, and I, like I said, I'm not trying to Im imply that before this uh, intensified climate change, um, ethnic relations were, were, were utopian. They weren't, and there were conflicts, but not at the rate that they have been now. And people didn't understand themselves as different from each other the way that they do now. Like, and, and, and definitely not through these categories which have emerged of African and Arab. Those were, they were there, but not, not as pronounced as they are now. So. I, I, and, and one of the issues is, is that when the international press talks about our issues in Sudan, they just make it seem that simple, right? But it's not. And a lot of it's got to do with ecology and a lot of it's got to do with the environment. And, and I don't think that at this point, of course, we have to, the global fight against climate change is gonna be the lifeline for countries like Sudan and other countries. But I, I genuinely think that right now, what we need to be figuring out is the resource sharing mechanisms in the face of the scarcity that we're all facing, because I don't see the global North uh, or the West reducing their global emissions in time. Um, I don't see capitalists stopping what they're doing in time for this problem to stop. It's just going to get worse and worse. And it's not just going to happen in Sudan. It's going to happen everywhere. You know, it's going to eventually come here to, I mean, the West too. So um, I don't know if the arid situation can be solved, although reforestation and all of these beautiful things are necessary. But I don't know if, 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 if the, what we need to be figuring out now is conflict resolution mechanisms and, and ecological solutions to conflict, conflict resolution. All right. Um, 
very interesting discussion. Um, there still is the Islamic question that uh, Salah brought up that you haven't touched on, but uh, maybe you can talk about that somehow, uh, come back around that in the general discussion. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, Nick now ha has, has prepared some comments uh, on particularly uh, water conflict and its relationship to uh, the developments in the Sudan. So Nick, uh, without further ado, we open the floor to you. Um, I mean, if you want to finish with, I mean, finish some of these very interesting discussions, I didn't feel particularly, uh, you know, sort of that I've got something massively important to say. So um, <laughs> always humble. I, mean, I think they're extremely interesting discussions. I mean, <clears throat> uh, and the ecological dimension to these conflicts is very important. But I think we should always remember that, you know, ethnicity. Uh, the, the ethnic, so-called ethnic conflicts that we see today, I mean, they are politically manipulated. And that, um, you know, for every person who, who suddenly self-identifies now as an Arab against an African, there'll probably be someone else who doesn't I'd buy into those, um, those categories and as he is opposed to them. So, you know, those, it's also finding a voice and a political organization and strength for those who, uh, are not um, uh, don't don't hate each other, and who are looking towards cooperation and and a different a different um, expression of uh, ethnicity that isn't hatred. So yeah. I mean, this is really important. You know, I mean, it's it's not that everyone in the in Darfur has suddenly gone into different camps. I mean, yes, some have, but um, they're not irredeemably so. I mean, there is yeah. a lot of political mobilization around ethnicity by people who benefit from it. Yeah. But, I mean, I think there's also, I mean, I think that when we're talking about identity, <clears throat> it seems like there's at least three different kinds that have been mentioned. One is like a kind of, what we were calling ethnicity, but sometimes is referred to as a tribal identity. Um, that's a complicated terminology. Then there's this African versus Arab thing, which is not exactly ethnic. Uh, maybe it is. It's, it's a, somehow a, a larger category. And then there's this orthogonal category, which is Islam. So how these different identity groups or different kinds of ways of dividing the, the ethnoscape or the whatever uh, humanity in that region, how, how, uh, how, to, how to navigate that very complicated terrain. Yeah, and, and Islam is not, again, it's not this unitary Islam. I mean, there's a loads of traditions of, uh, yeah. of Sufi Islam in, in, yeah. in, um, in Sudan that are, you know, are not, don't, are not um, part of, are not Muslim Brotherhood versions. That's Islam. right. But Mohammed would know a lot more about that than I do. <laughs> I see Marco has his hand up. Yeah, no, it was just based on what you said, and I was, it made me wonder. Um, if it is possible for 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 someone to exist uh, within society, um, but without uh, adhering to those identities by their own volition, of course, or do you need to, you know, pick a lane, pick a side? Is, is that necessary under the current circumstances? Very good question. Yeah, Muhammad, I think I think Nick is asking you to say some more before he talks about water. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, people look like there is political um, manipulation of the of, of ethnic difference is a huge issue, and it's one of the biggest issues that we we're dealing with in Sudan. Um, the Islam question is complicated, but like like Nick said, I wouldn't I, I know about that because my parents were part of a Muslim Sufi. Uh, socialist movement, which their leader was hanged on charges of apostasy by the Muslim Brotherhood, um, the Mahmoud Muhammad Taha, um, who tried to also contend, who tried to develop a different vision of the role, the, the relationship between the public sphere and, and Islam, which was predicated on um, on pluralism. And, and and this is a really important part of the story of Islam because it's it's a story that's that's the democratic modernity aspect of the of the story, the hidden part of the story. It's that. 
Mahmoud Muhammad Taha in 1985 was hanged on apostasy charges, not necessarily because of all of the things that already put him outside of the fold of traditional Sunni Islam, like, for example, uh, women should have the right to divorce, um, women should have uh, full inheritance, not one third of the man, etc. All of these things which were already scandalous, but it was because he released a pamphlet called Either This or the Flood, which warned Numeri that if he was going to impose Sharia law on Sudan, then that would cause fissures with the South and eventually lead the South to feel alienated and, 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 and increase the war, which is what happened, you know? And that too is just as Muslim as the Muslim Brotherhood, um, but it's not seen as so because it, they weren't the victors. The Muslim Brotherhood precisely brought, came to the fore and got a lot of power in Sudan because they were able to mobilize ethnic difference and religious difference for their own gain. Okay, and because my parents moving the Republican movement refused to play that game, they didn't, they were not, the, 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 the vision for Sudan that they had, which was based on plurality and the love of difference, but not the mobilization of difference to the point where we're killing each other. Um, that, 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 that vision didn't win out. Um, so that's why I, I think that like, um, on the Islam question, on, on all of these different complexities of all of these different things, the most important thing is, and again, call me naive, but humanism is really important here. You know, we need to be able to develop a humanism, which is not the liberal humanism, but the, the, that anti-colonial humanist project, which academics yeah. scoff at and laugh at so much, like whether that's like what Fanon was talking about, whether that's what, um, what, uh, 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 Abdullah Ejalan has been talking about in his writings, what Huey Newton and the Black Panther Party talked about, that humanism is a really important aspect of, 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 of our, uh, should be an important aspect of our emancipatory horizons, the kind of politics yeah. that we're engaging in. And I think that that kind of humanism is really important. And I think, for example, in the same way that it's just as important in, in Kurdistan for a Kurd to be recognized that they're Kurdish, there will be no solution to the problems of Kurdistan until Turks stop seeing themselves as Turks, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that, for me, is is one of the things about my my identity in Sudan. I'm considered as part of the Arab group, but I want to renounce my Arabness for the sake of the country, you know. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean just renouncing it. It means a, be a race traitor, you know, in the Ignatian sense. Be an ethnic traitor of if you know that your ethnicity is the powerful ethnicity and that you you that the political forces in the country have mobilized in such a way that they've reified an identity for you that is the, the, the reason why all these other people are being oppressed, you know? Yeah. And so it's just, so, it's just yeah. So my, I, I just have a, 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 a quick question to add to the discussion with respect to like how these resistance committees deal with these issues. Yeah. Do they have a position on this? How does this play itself out in the context of uh, the resistance committees? I mean, the resistance committees, as as um, Saleh Mamun said, is the, the most of the resistance committees we hear about are in Khartoum. There's 5,000 of them in many different countries. And what they always do, including the ones in Darfur, is they, they go against the traditional boundaries of how politics is drawn with the, the idea of being a Sudan, which accepts, a, a, which accepts difference, but a Sudan against war, a Sudan against corruption, a Sudan against the power of the agricultural classes um, dominating the, the big agricultural capitalists dominating everyone else. They are really reimagining what it means to be Sudanese. Again, maybe a necessary thing that needs to happen, you know, um, and, and are refusing to play the old game. The old games of, of how politics is run, but whether it's people, you know, claiming that they 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 represent the African interests or the Arab interests, or people claiming they represent Muslim interests, they reject all of that. They reject theocracy. They reject um, they reject uh, ethnic mobilization in the way that's been ha happening in Sudan. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're colorblind. That doesn't mean they don't they don't acknowledge the differences. They don't acknowledge marginalization. But they want a holistic approach to the problems of Sudan through a redefined uh, understanding of Sudanese nationalism. Stella wanted to say something. Sonia's got her hand up again. What, Sonia? You have an important question because I don't. I have a very practical question. Oh, I just have a question on gender. Um, because, I mean, we've spoken about ecology, we've spoken about um, ontology, we've spoken about um, 
ethnicity, but really we haven't spoken about uh, the female role here. I'm sorry about this lantern in the darkness. I'm living in the Victorian era here. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was just curious, uh, what is the what are the women's roles in this? Um, we haven't spoken about that, and I, I don't know I don't know much about it. If you could please clarify something, talk about it a little bit. So great. Yeah, I mean, one of the things about the women's roles, um, and which is really important right now, and I hope that somehow this can happen, where a connection happens between the Kurdish women's movement and the resistance committees, um, specifically on the conversation of uh, co-leadership, co co um, because the women, even the women are the most impacted by all of, the, all of what we're talking about, in terms of the fact that when ethnic breakdown happens, rape becomes the tool of people to put communities in submission and specifically women in submission. It's the vast majority of, 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 of people who struggle and who are moving into the IDB camps and who have to carry the whole community with them. Um, when all of these issues happen related to everything that we're talking about is women, but neither the resistance committees and I, you know, I'm full supportive, fully supportive of the Sudanese revolution, but something needs to be recognized here, have addressed the issue of, um, of women's emancipation sufficiently. Um, and uh, the women's movement is organizing autonomously for this reason. One of the biggest recent issues that happened just three weeks ago was there were these sit-ins that cropped up after some revolutionaries were killed in the occasional protests. And there was a situation where women were attacked um, in those sit-ins um, uh, because, uh, because they didn't like follow the moral code, which is basically <laughs> imposed by the Muslim Brotherhood for 30 years. And they organized a very successful women's march um, right afterwards. Um, thousands of women turned up and protested against, they, they basically with the slogan, your enemy is not me, it's the police, you know, basically trying to impose on the Sudanese revolutionaries that patriarchy or patriarchal mindset is an obstacle to all of the, the claims that they talk about, whether it's ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are right now, the resistance committees are basically divided um, between two groups, but those two groups are actually uniting and they're trying to write one big manifesto. One manifesto says that Sudan should be run along radical democratic lines with the resistance committees representing um, uh, Sudan uh, based on direct democracy um, and, uh, and uh, the joint with the power from the trade unions. And this is called the, the, the Revolutionary Charter for the Peoples of Sudan. There's another charter. I forgot the naming in Arabic because in reality, in Arabic, both of the charters have almost the same name. But the other one is more of a liberal, um, a liberal charter. Um, but none of these charters, even though all of them have basically proposed something al along the lines of a very similar to a democratic confederalist project. I mean, half the more radical ones have taken that one, the radical democracy one. None of them have brought in the... Um, the, the question of, of, of the distribution of power among women. And I think that this is where uh, it would be very, very powerful um, and something that I'm trying to organize if the Sudanese women's movement got in touch with the uh, Kurdish women's movement and talked about the role of incorporating a kind of um, uh, co-chair system into the revolutionary charters for the resistance committees, because um, the yeah, the, all of the resistance committees spontaneously um, have have come to the conclusion that uh, the devolution of power into communities um, through direct democracy <clears throat> is the way forward for Sudan, and that's a huge huge development among all of the all of the revolutionary groups that have emerged since uh, since the so-called Arab Spring. You know, it's 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 huge huge uh, development, but there's still inadequate uh, focus or mention. On, on, on the question of women's emancipation. <clears throat> All right, Estella. Yeah, well, that brings me directly to my question that I had, because over the years, we have been in touch with people from Sudan who live in London and elsewhere, and also people who actually went to the region and worked on several projects like one of the ones that Nick also knows, one of them, Azri Akuri, who worked with uh, people on the, uh, in some areas 
where people were trying to build an alternative along the river because of the problems that were posed through the difficulties on the water issue, etc. In London itself, we have been in touch with people from Sudan, from different regions, and over the years, they have attended Kurdish events and have been fully supporting the Kurds in the different struggles. And I just wanted to ask when, for example, what are the openings? What are the possibilities of connections you just mentioned that you are attempting to, uh, to uh, find a way that the women speak to the women from Ojawa, making connections? But what about people traveling to the region and meeting people and maybe discussing things together, not just yourself as being Sudanese, but from other parts of the movement. Because this was precisely what was successful in uh, uh, the attempts that we made in Kenya and the presence of somebody, you know, of. Uh, <clears throat> Um, of Czech in the region and working with the local communities and together, you know, developing new projects. So it seems to me that it isn't just a question of discussing and working out a strategy, because that can only be done in coordination with the communities on the ground. Okay. And it seems to me that the different here in London and have all different links to different, what you call ethnic groups, were actually very much unified in the general question of how the situation should be resolved. And that is extremely interesting, okay? So, and we are talking about quite a diaspora community. So we have to have the links both you know, in the discussion to the diaspora community that is still there, and it is also around in Europe and in the UK. And, you know, unfortunately, Hagia is not here. <laughs> but through her, she was a member, founding member, as being a Sudanese woman of campaign against criminalizing community. One of the big tribes, who was very active here in London, trying to defend her community for the past 25, 30 years, okay? And had uh, quite some connections. So we have to see it from the real world, not from the abstract world of theoretical discussions here, okay? I mean, it's all very well, and I agree, uh, you know, to a large extent on the, links that you make with Ojalan in relation to the central issues. But the issue is, what is the relations between the peoples here on the ground? What can be created on the ground as okay. concrete conditions to develop these things? That's is right. it possible in this situation where you still have a big army and et cetera, et cetera? Can we only discuss it on Zoom? Okay. No, I, and, and you're right. I mean, now especially. You, uh, you understand my point. 100%, I mean, but now especially. Discussions that we have, and of course, we will continue the discussions, and we want to actually develop a policy, and, Definitely. you know, towards it. And we need your, you know, your, your, your knowledge, your, uh, you know, very detailed knowledge, plus your life, your, who you are within the community in order to create these conditions to do that work. This is both the Kurdish connection, but also the international connections, the other people who are interested. I remember a big, uh, you know, quite a, a good meeting from refugee communities at some stage 
that uh, Czech was there as well, and we had I think we lost Estella just now. She's frozen. Unfortunately. How can we create through the refugee community, okay, back. but also through the other knowledge, you know, a combined struggle to deal with these things, okay? And as I said, it's wonderful. A Sudanese woman, you know, representing a tribe and her people here become somebody who sets up a group, you know, that defends the Kurds and the PKK. So I'm saying there is a, an important lesson to learn on these things, how we actually proceed in not just creating analysis and so on. Okay? So I just. Well taken. <laughs> Your point is well taken, absolutely. Yeah, okay. All right, I think uh, it might be time for Nick to tell us about water conflict because it's, it's. I was. I'm. I. I mean. I'm. I'm. I'm just looked at the clock, and it's going to yeah. be. Quite, it's getting on. <laughs> exactly. I, mean, I. I wonder. I've written something, so perhaps the 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 one way forward would be I just circulate it to everyone. Uh, Estelle, what do you think? Like, there's nothing particularly revolutionary in what I'm saying. I mean, what I'm, I mean, the main points I'm making are, you know, that uh, uh, I was asked to look at some, the likely impacts of, of some mega projects that are infrastructure projects that are planned along or being implemented along the Nile. Um, and also how choices over the regional management of water have the potential to support or undermine the struggle for democratic confederalism and I, I mean the, the I just look at two two big projects one reason two big projects outside of Sudan and the reason for that is that um, uh, actually uh, many of the choices that um, are being made about water management of the Nile are being made outside of Sudan and that for me does really argue for exactly the sort of alliance building that um that Estelle has been talking about um if 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 different if different uh, voices that we heard and in particularly if the negotiations between governments over water are to reflect a grassroots perspective um and then within Sudan there are choices over water I mean the big cho I mean a lot of people confronted with uh a situation where they're living on a shared river um, and where an upstream neighbor, in this case, um, Ethiopia, but it could have been Turkey or, or Iran in the case of the Iraqi Kurds and the uh, Iraq and um, the Turkish Kurds, um, where one of the, the upstream neighbors seeks to monopolize the water or block it through, through building dams and so on. One reaction is, to build more dams yourself, and this is exactly the reaction actually in the Kurdish region of um, of Iraq. You know, they want to build fifty new dams, um, and partly to be able to themselves put pressure on Baghdad downstream. I mean, it's a beggar my neighbor approach, and it's also, prof I mean, unaware or or ignoring the very inherent anti-democratic tendency and trajectory of centralized systems like dams. I mean, a dam requires, whether you like it or not, a technocratic elite to, um, to manage it. Um, and that has its own, its own uh, political dynamic. So, I mean, whereas there are other choices, and these are, I mean, uh, uh, and my question really to Mohammed would be whether the street committees are looking at these other choices, like, for example, water harvesting, which is, uh, you know, involves, it involves, I'm, I'm being waved at by Anne to say that a supper is getting ready, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, which involves uh, uh, local communities, um, 
setting up their own tank village tanks. Um, I mean, large. I mean, the, the uh, tanks to 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 collect rainwater to manage that rainwater themselves through their own committees, and through that rainwater to actually recharge aquifers and so on and so forth. This is a a political choice over technology, but it's a technology that has a completely different dynamic politically to large dams. So that's what I've written about. Um, but I, I mean, it may be a better option to send it around to you all. Yeah, well, I, I'd appreciate it. I, I, I'd appreciate it if you sent it anyway, because I think it would be a good thing to um, read and reference in the future. Very much so. Uh, definitely send it. And I think I think that th that sort of summary already brings up really crucial question, which was already uh, implicit in some of uh, uh, the stuff that Muhammad was saying, which I think is a, a, a more general interest for us. As you point out, uh, we have this, 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 the Kurds face the same problem, which is that uh, uh, if, the, if the Turks control upstream the water supply, uh, they can cut off the ability for the Rojava revolution to do any interesting experiments in social ecology, what have you. So we have the more general question of how do we, uh, how do we organize and mobilize uh, uh, for grassroots direct dem democratic uh, uh, projects uh, if the ecological questions are overdetermined by bigger geopolitical uh, forces? Uh, how, do you, how do you think about that, Mohammed? I'm honestly, I'm, I'm just learning at this point. I really don't, um, I don't really have answers to that. But what I do know is that I don't think the resistance committee has done those kinds of uh, things that you're talking about. But um, I'm, I'm actually interested myself in hearing what other people have to say about that, because I, um, I'm not sure. If I may ask, um, the committees right now, because you mentioned quite a few committees, you mentioned the uh, support, um, what was it? Let's go back to my notes. <laughs> um, the rapid support um forces which was Mohammed Hamidan and then you mentioned um that there's a women's group and I'm, I'm just trying to figure out I'm trying to map it in my head how all of these committees how these groups work merge work or don't work with each other um I think it would be helpful if you could write something and send it out to us in terms of like a um a graph or a diagram or something that shows how that works so that we can better understand the, because um, it looks quite intricately webbed. Um, <laughs> and um, I think it's really important to understand those um, institutions, those uh, committees, those, whatever their, their, ter their terminology is, um, because it helps us then understand how the water is being monopolized, how the ecology is being monopolized or, uh, what the limitations are that they face um, in terms of the brief and quite detailed descriptions that you've given it's, it's just too it's too left and right to understand how it merges together um, if I could understand that then I would better understand what the limitations are that you face and I presume so too would other people as well Absolutely. I'm, I'm just going to be spending some time in the notes, just sending some uh, resources for people to understand the resistance committees a little bit more. Okay, thank you. So maybe maybe uh, 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 we get Nick to respond a little bit to his own provocation, his own question, the questions that are posed by uh, uh, this issue of uh, 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 the decisions crucial decisions being made upstream. I think part of your answer has to do with like mobilizing uh, for social ecological pro projects that are more uh, uh, compatible with local radical democratic control. Um, uh, is, there, is there more that can be uh, uh, formulated uh, with respect to a strategy for dealing with this issue? Can I comment here? Yeah, I do. Let's okay, just, just, it. just very briefly, I mean, this relates to a, a, a much broader issue about you know, what are technologies or techniques or whatever we call them. They always have social aspects, meaning that their design embeds particular ways of 
organizing society and decision making. And I mean, as Nick explained, at least some small scale dams have a, a potential for a, a socio technical design, which is more potentially democratic. Potentially. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, any of these technologies can be even the most um, seemingly benign can be used in a way which is very un undemocratic. But in in terms of just to respond to the question that um, that uh, Jeff uh, raised, I mean, you know, there isn't an easy solution. But uh, I mean, um, it seems to me that at least two strategies are important. One is to build on the ground the uh, types of uh, 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 the types of agroecological systems and water supply systems, including you know reuse of of water, including um, village tanks and so on, that uh, support the commons. But that but the, the, and and whose whose aim isn't just to supply water, whose aim is actually to build society. Yeah. and to build the commons so it's a the whole the whole way of organizing to to um to dig village tanks uh to decide where they are uh, in in a community and so on to um create the institutions the village institutions and more broadly the basin wide institutions um i mean the, in in the in india the rajasthan example for example they have uh, um, not just village committees, but they build these com village committees up to a, uh, a water parliament that's that's right the way through the um, the the um, that particular Alwa um, watershed. So th this is about creating society. It's not just about supplying water, and I think that's one very important uh, response. And not least because it it, really, it 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 replenishes local water supplies. It replenishes forests. It replenishes um, uh, uh, um, groundwaters and so on, and in doing so, it also makes you less vulnerable to your water being cut off by the Turks or the the Iranians or the um, Ethiopians or whoever. So uh, that's one response. The other response is to try and build um, pressure for intergovernmental um, uh, negotiations. I mean, Turkey has uh, hasn't had proper negotiations for thirty years. Uh, and that does require building alliances, and alliances not just with um, uh, Ethiopians or, or, or um, within Turkey or within Iran or whatever, but also outside. I mean, it 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 does entail uh, using, um, you know, in the Turkish example, uh, those who can put pressure on Turkey. Um, yeah, you know, they're not going to come to the table unless some pretty big, big sticks are sort of waved over there, waved against them. And at the moment, with the Ukrainian crisis, everyone is um, is looking to. I mean, NATO is not going to do. None of the NATO powers are going to do anything to upset Turkey. So, um, yeah, it's a complicated. It's complicated. But it's it's a, it's always it's always about alliance building. So it's about practical stuff on the ground. To lessen dependence on outs outside uh, water supplies, but it's also about um, building alliances that can constrain hegemonic power of upstream states, and that's that's not that's not going to happen overnight. Yeah, Stella, uh, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to add precisely that because. Denial, the water security, denial question, and the whole water reservoirs is actually a question for the whole rich. It is not just for, uh, a, a, you know, for Sudan. And the importance of this is that you can build alliances around this issue, because we had a few people that we were writing to to come on to this discussion. It was a professor somewhere a university, Nick, can you remember? He, he, he wrote to us, he's in a project in Sudan, I think even, you know, working locally on a, on, on a water project. 
okay? And he is linked, I think, also to Greenpeace, yeah, and some, some other organization. So they are looking more on, as I said, water security is a general issue, looking at all the, uh, uh, you know, which gives an opportunity for communities to be united across the region on this issue. That's, that's my point, okay? And I do think that's an important one to investigate at least, all right? Yeah, so the, the idea of, of uh, the ecological dimension to the extent that this ecological dimension can only be addressed transnationally, let yeah. that be a basis for organizing transnationally. Yeah, I mean, it should certainly be considered because that would break, you know, somehow this uh, thing, it's only state, the issue of the state, the issue, it's just so done. No, it isn't. It's all the surrounding communities. Okay. So it's uh, <laughs> it's a challenge to the Sudanese state as well. Okay. To bring these communities somehow in, in contact, who are working on this issue. And I thought there are initiatives who are trying to do that. I'm not sure if some of the people who went to the water conference in Iraq even come, came from these parts next day when they met in Iraq and Kurdistan. Yeah, there was, um, I mean, Ali came to, to that. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I didn't, I mean, you know, there's not a single environmental issue that I've worked on. Um, I mean, that hasn't required some cross-border um, yeah. alliance building. You know, I mean, the, the environment doesn't respect borders. So, so um, it doesn't have borders. So, so uh, I mean, this is, you know, I mean, grandparents teaching grandchildren, whatever the expression is, sucking eggs, et cetera, et cetera. So, so uh, yeah, but it is part of the way forward. And I would really encourage, you know, um, comrades in Sudan and the street committees in Sudan to, uh, and I'd love to hear the discussions that they're having about these sort of issues and how they and how we, they are reaching out. And if they are, they don't have people to reach out to because they don't know them. Then I mean, let's let's. I mean, there's there's much that can be done to to assist that. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Stella's suggestion uh, to Mohammed is ex exactly on point. That part of what we can do as a network is kind of intervene at the grassroots with our personal connections. So, Mohammed, you if that's if that discussion isn't happening, you can help make that discussion happen. Yeah. That's the, that's the point, yeah, okay, because uh, without that, you know, I mean, you're not going to be able to move in this crisis situation that we're operating in, you know, you're working in a war situation, you know, everywhere, so, I mean, how do we, can, can we create this? Now, unfortunately, the people I asked here in London, in the UK, you are still around, from Sudan, they didn't come today, sorry to say, okay? So, but maybe there's a way to link, at least I will send them the recording, okay? And maybe they can comment on that, or one can even arrange a separate little meeting with two or three people and Mohammed and see if they can help from their side, whatever connections they have over there, okay? And if this, can be somehow developed. But the transnational thing for Sudan and the region and, and the ecological issue, you know, is absolutely insufferable for me and also for the Democratic Confederalist project. Okay. I mean, you know. And I think with respect to like. That you are having, you know, we are pointing towards that. Yeah. I, I, and I think I think with respect to sort of developing the democratic and federal paradigm, I do think that uh, that uh, transnational or internationalist dimension is something that that we can't rely on Ojalon alone or the Kurds alone to formulate that. That I yeah. think we need to we need to be active in the formulation of what that internationalist dimension requires, but uh, tactically and strategically. 
and without people coming there, like without Chef going to Kenya, it wouldn't have happened, to be frank. Okay? That's the truth of it. Okay? So we do need intervention. We can be, we can play a role, you know, a constructive role, making the link, talking to these communities, giving them the chance to read, to listen, to be able to at least think about it. If they now accept it or reject it, that depends. But, you know, I mean, I think the ideas are powerful enough to test that out. But we have to invest in that. We have to take the time to do it, okay? And, you know, Sudan is such an important place. You know, it's that thing our whole for Africa, for the rest of Africa as well. And after all, we are planning an Africa symposium in October, okay? So these things, what we discussed today, will be very important in the discussion. And maybe we can then invite people who are at today's seminar for the discussion that we will have to plan the symposium on Africa. Saleh is already a part of that, and Nick is also. I hope you remember that. <laughs> okay. All right. You're so, raping me in, Estella, whether I like it or not. <laughs> Uh, it no, follows from the main point that you made, Nick. <laughs> uh, no, I agree. I was totally, of course, you know, I'm just teasing out Estella. Just, I'm going to have to go, I'm afraid, because um, otherwise yeah. the supper That's is okay. Going. But um, many, many thanks. And it was a really fantastic discussion. I've sent, I've sent that, um, I've sent that, that uh, note, the, the, my talk around, and I sent it to Estella so that she can send it to the broader list. Yeah, I mean, I've got the text, so we can put it on the on the recording somehow. Okay. Okay. Cool. All yeah. Right. Thank you very much, Nick. It was lovely to see everyone. Yeah. And thanks, to, uh, Jeff and Estella, particularly for organizing. Yeah. Uh, Estella. Ciao. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Sonia, thank you very much. So how? So do we, we do we call this a general <laughs> end? We call this yeah, a general. Well, I mean, end. Many thanks. To you.